Welcome back. Today we'll be covering the histology of the salivary glands and the pancreas. The salivary glands are going to be your exocrine glands, and there are three of them. The parotid here in the cheek is going to be the largest one, the sublingual beneath the tongue, and the submandular uh, below the jaw. And they're all located in the connective tissue below the epithelia, lining the oral cavity. And they all have glands, depending on where they are. They have the labial, which are like, you know, in your, in your mouth area, uh, the palatine, and the von Ebner's gland. And here is the circumvit papilla with the uh, von Ebner's glands. Uh, if you recall, the glands uh, secrete a kind of mucus solution, a serous solution, to wash the taste buds to um, prime them for the next uh, gustatory sensation. So these salivary glands don't have any capsule. All they do is make the saliva. There are large glands that have septa and then those uh, separate it into those lobules. And the myoepithelial cells are going to be found between the basal surface of the acinar cells and the basal lamina around the duct. And here's the duct. Here are the serous cells um, on the edge, the, the mucus, acini, and then um, there are going to be the canaliculus, and this is the mixed acini. So in development, first it's like innervated and it, it, it grows in and then follows the path of the lobules. And the epithelial cells are the serous cells, who are, which are like kind of pyramidal, round-ish, and um, they have essentially located a nucleus and a well-developed uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. They're all kind of joined with each other by these tight junctions, and they make the acinus with the central lumen. And they are polarized, so on one end there's going to be more uh, like rough ER, which is in the basal region, and on the apical end, there are more uh, secretory granules. The mucus cells, on the other hand, are columnar, and they're organized in tubes. These are polarized, and they are going to have one end. The basal end has the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the nucleus, and then the apical end has the mucin secretory uh, granules, and a, a very defined Golgi apparatus. So as you can see, there is some kind of like a pattern. The apical region always has the uh, secretory granules, which makes sense because um, that's where they are secreted from like the tops of the cell. Uh, the bases of the cells are usually like adherent to the lamina propria or the basement membrane. Okay, so the ducts. There are a couple different kinds, the intercalated and the striated ducts. And they don't have a lot of connective tissue, as you can see. They're all pretty, like, you know, crammed in there. The intercalated ducts are going to drain the individual secretary uh, units. These are going to be lined with the cuboidal epithelium. And those add um, uh, bicarbonate to the saliva. And the striated ducts are going to be columnar cells. And they are infoldings of the basal lateral cell membrane and numerous mitochondria um, inside of them make this striation. And those cells can absorb uh, sodium and secrete potas or, yeah, potassium ions to buffer the saliva because remember the cuboidal and will add the, um, the bicarbonate. IgA is going to be made by the plasma cells, of course, in the um, in the connective tissue around the intralobular duct. They're going to be taken up by the serous acini and released into saliva. The intralobular ducts are going to drain into the interlobular, uh, like into the interlobular duct, and all of those are excretory ducts, and they're embedded in the connective tissue. So interlobular are going to surround the lobes and lobules. Intra is inside. So these are going to be aligned by either simple or stratified cuboidal or uh, columnar epithelium. 
and the pseudo stratified epithelium. So the main duct's epithelium is replaced by the stratified squamous as it goes into the oral vestibule. So they kind of start off with like taller cells and they get flatter and then you get squamous epithelium. So the parotid gland, the one in the cheek, is the largest one and it only makes a, a serous solution. It secretes uh, the alpha amylase and the lysozymes to break down uh, carbohydrates in the mouth. And they're defined by these like very large and very prominent uh, striated ducts. These ducts are pretty big. And they have uh, a lot of adipose uh, tissue surrounding it, and really depending on the face. Some people have a lot of buccal uh, fat, some people don't. Well, if you can recall, like this artery from um, anatomy is going to be like your facial artery. So the submandibular glands are going to be the ones below the jaw, and it's a mixed serous and mucous gland, and they mostly serous though. And the mixed asini have a little cap on it, which is like a demi loon of um, myoepithelial cells, and those will also secrete amylase and lysozyme, and the ducts like oh, they they secrete it go down through the um, the intralobular ducts into the interlobular ducts, and then they are released in this through the striated ducts. Um, the, there aren't as many intercalated ducts and striated ducts as the parotid gland, and uh, in cases of rabies, there's going to be an overproduction of watery saliva, which makes the frothing of the mouth. So the sublingual glands are the ones beneath your tongue, and these are also a compound gland, but this one has the uh, more mucous asini, while the um, the submandibular gland has more of the uh, serous asini. Um, so the serous cells are only on the demi loons, once again, as these little caps. And this one has absolutely no intercalated or striated ducts. So what is saliva? Saliva is a mix of enzyme and mucus, and uh, it has several uh, functions. Uh, swallowing, digesting, um, the IgA will limit the bacterial growth, and it has a high um, bicarb content, of course. The production is stimulated by the parasympathetic uh, system um, and inhibited by the sympathetic system. Um, it's stimulated by, like, um, like smells, too. Um, atropine will block the parasympathetic action, and there is that's usually used to treat like saliorrhea, which is um, overproduction of saliva. And there is going to be uh, xerostomia, which is caused by radiation or antihistamine. Or this is um, also dry mouth, which doesn't sound too bad. You're like, oh, what a problem to have dry mouth. But it, it's actually pretty terrible because um, the, the entire oral cavity along with the, the throat, like down to the esophagus, is going to be um, very uncomfortable. Um, these people aren't going to be able to like eat because it's so painful. Um, all of the mucosa is kind of like exposed, and um, remember the mucosa is only covered by non-keratinized, uh, st uh, pseudostratified um, epithelium, and it's going to rub and it's going to hurt. And um, these people aren't even going to be able to swallow normally. Okay, so moving right on to the pancreas. Uh, this is going to be your exocrine and endocrine uh, gland. It's covered by a thin capsule of loose connective tissue, and that invaginates in to make the septa. And the lobules are going to be made of the exocrine secretory uh, axoni, the duct system, and the islet of Langerhans. The exocrine secretory asini is covered by this delicate sheath of reticular fibers, and um, it's problematic because it's it's quite delicate. So um, in pancreatitis, uh, there can be a rupture of the fibers with the rich capillary network, so um, it can bleed out quite easily too. The islet of Langerhans are these like like 
kind of lighter stained spherical masses and those are your endocrine cells and you can barely see but they're covered by a thin reticular capsule the compound um, asinine glands are just going to be serous glands there are no adipose tissue or myoepithelial cells found in the pancreas so if you see like a fatty pancreas that's clearly a sign of a problem the serous asini are going to be irregular clusters and they're around like a smallish lumen and that is drained by a short intercalated duct and the pancreas makes a lot of pancreatic juices because um, these are used for digestion so the asinash cells are going to make um, like proteases and those are going to be uh, inactive zymogens. Why is that? It's because the, um, the, the pancreatic juice has to drain into uh, the duodenum and if they're already active, it's going to eat away at the duodenum. So they make all of these. Okay, so the duct system begins in the lumens of the asinus, and it's first like aligned by a central asinar cell, and that's only in the pancreas. And then the intercalated ducts are going to be aligned by the simple cuboidal epithelium to make the uh, bicarbonate, which is going to um, make the enzymes like you know zymogen, so they're inactive, and those will merge into the intralobular ducts which are aligned also by simple cuboidal epithelium, and then those drained into the interlobular ducts. Interlobular ducts, um, okay, so like things are starting to change, aligned by simple columnar epithelium instead, and it joins the main pancreatic duct, which is um, lined by tall columnar epithelium. So it just gets like taller because um, there are more, uh, It's like, it has to drain more fluid, so these cells need to be a little bit more robust. So. It drains into the um, duodenum with this, like, you know, herringbone pattern. And there is a main duct, the duf duct of versing. And the duct of versing is the one that has the tall columnar epithelium. And then it goes into the um, hepatopancreatic ampulla of Vatter. And um, there's also this bile duct. Sometimes there's the anastomosis, but usually there isn't. Okay, so pancreatic cancer is rare, but it's uh, deadly because um, we often don't catch it on time because not everybody like su suspects pancreatic cancer the minute they have like, you know, um, hypogastric pain or whatever. We, we kind of assume that it's more common cancers like stomach cancers, like duodenum, um, uh, duodenum uh, obst obstruction. Um, we don't just jump straight to pancreatic cancer because like the only way you can really tell is to do a biopsy of the pancreas and uh, usually 80% of them are adenocarcinomas of the duct system so something's going wrong with the cuboidal or the columnar cells and they're just non-specific symptoms I mean you don't go into the um, into the hospital because of uh, fatigue and um, well like some people do but the the non-specific symptoms like fatigue sometimes a headache like sometimes it comes sometimes it goes sometimes you have stomach pain sometimes you don't and that can all also be chalked up to like GERD so unfortunately by the time of the diagnosis 50% of the patients have like the metastasis to the lymph nodes in the lung and it presents with painless um, obstructive jaundice but like that's when you know like the pancreas is kind of shot by that time um, here is the pleomorphism so all these cells um are part of the tumor and look there's not like there's not really any organization there's just like a bunch of cells and so pancreatic juice is alkaline fluid and it drains into the duodenum uh, like i said through the duct of uh, versing and through the um ampulla of vatter um like i said these enzymes have to be uh, inactive because if they are active in the pancreas they can cause inflammation and auto digestion of the um, pancreas itself acute pancreatitis uh, can be caused by like gallstones trauma infection and alcohol abuse in the duodenum that's when the enteropeptidases will cleave the um, inactive 
uh, trypsinogen into trypsin, and then trypsin is the magic like key. It activates all the other zymogens, um, such as trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, and those will work to hydrolyze proteins. The um, uh, ribonuclease and they will split the nucle nucleic acids. Amylase, the starch and, per and glycol uh, glycogen, pardon me. And um, lipase will hydrolyze the triglycerides, and cholesterol esterase, of course, will hydrolyze uh, cholesterol. Okay, so cholecystokinin will stimulate the acinar cells to secrete the enzymes in the proenzymes. Secretin will stimulate the duct cells to secrete water in the bicarbonate, and then the parasympathetic fibers in the vagal trunk, so cranial nerve number 10 will apply low stimulus to the SNR cells and the ducts in, in response to anticipation to a meal. So, um, you know, when you're hungry and you already see the meal in the restaurant and you smell the food, um, this is going to help the response of, like, you know, uh, salivating. And um, this is also why, like, you know, when you're when you're hungry and you see food, you can feel your guts, like, rumble or um, move around. This is the anticipation. Okay, so this is the endocrine portion of the uh, pancreas, and that's involved with the islet of Langerhans. And those are more in the tail. The cells are going to be uh, like sort of rounded and lightly stained. They have cytoplasmic uh, granules, and uh, they really only can be um, distinguished from one each other using the immunohistochemistry. Uh, like all of these are like sort of the same. You look at this and you're just like, oh, that's just the eyelid of Langerhans. Of, um, Langer the beta cells are the most common. They secrete uh, insulin. Alpha cells will secrete glucagon. Delta cells are pretty rare and they secrete the somatostatin, which will influence um, glucagon secretion. And um, the pancreatic peptide cells will um, secrete the pancreatic polypeptide. And those are very rare, like those are just kind of scattered within the, 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 within the islet itself. Oh, we're honestly not really sure about what um, the specific function of the uh, polypeptide does. We just know it's, it has some kind of role in, um, in digestion. Okay, so that's it for now. Thank you for your attention and good luck studying.